Welcome to Menopause Morph, your time to change. We're here to help you thrive through your menopause, bringing you experts in many fields to help you from perimenopause to menopause and beyond to become the strong, vibrant woman nature intended you to be. Hosted by Pauline McCarthy of the Pearls of Pauline. Pearls of wisdom, compassion, and joy. Welcome to this week's Menopause Morph. I have to say a sorry to all my listeners for the little pause. Actually, my husband took me to Bulgaria, so we didn't have last week's episode. But instead, we are going to have an amazing guy called Glenn Livingston. Glenn is a PhD. He's a veteran psychologist and a longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. You may have seen or his company's previous work, theories and research in major periodicals like the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times and many other newspapers. Or you might have heard him on ABC, CBS and many more radio stations. Glenn was disillusioned by what traditional psychology had to offer overweight and or food obsessed individuals. Dr Livingston spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating via work with his own patients and a self-funded research programme of more than 40,000 participants. Most important, however, was his own personal journey out of obesity and food prison to a normal, healthy weight and a much more light-hearted relationship with food. So, welcome, Dr. Glenn. Well, thank you so much. Please call me Glenn. And I want to go to Bulgaria. Oh, yes, it's great. I was in the mountains and I was in the spas and getting massages and it was like the best present my husband could ever give me. <laughs> I would recommend it to everybody. Lucky lady. Yes. So your topic about overeating and binging, chocolate is my thing. You know, not everybody is a binge eater or a chocoholic. When I was reading your bio and your things, I was imagining myself standing at Overeaters Anonymous saying, hello, my name is Polly. I am a chocoholic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And because we can laugh about it, but it's, it is a serious, serious problem for many people. Oh, it, when you feel like you can't control. And by the way, I, I've been through Overeaters Anonymous myself as part of my efforts to try to control the solution. And chocolate was really my thing. Yeah. Um, I, there's this little voice inside my head that says chocolate's a vegetable and it's hard to argue with it. <laughs> um, but I've actually learned how to ignore it. And that's kind of where we're going to go with this. But I believe that Overeaters Anonymous has the wrong message. It works for some people, but... It doesn't really work for everyone, and I think I know why. I mean, we can talk more about that as we go on. I actually went to Overeaters Anonymous here in Iceland, and but I found it wasn't for me. But I think for many people it is for them. But for me, it <laughs> anyway. We'll, we can discuss that another time. <laughs> well, well it, it's it's a message of powerlessness. Yeah. It, it's a message that says you really can't control this. The best that you can hope to do is abstain one day at a time. Yeah. From the research I've seen, I, I just don't see, think that there's any scientific proof of that. I think that it, it's an abdication of responsibility and free will. And I think particularly for women, that it, it disempowers them. I think women need to be given message of empowerment to know that they can be the master or, or mistress of their own fate. I don't like the continual emphasis on uncertainty that just any day this big binge is going to come upon you. You can't really do anything about it. You better get to a meeting. You're dependent upon all of us. There's nothing you can do. I, I don't think that's the right message, particularly for women in our culture. I, I think it's wrong. Yeah, that was that, that, that was actually the feeling that I got. That Of course, I believe in God and, and God can do many wonderful things, but I think we have our own responsibility. And it reminds me of, you know, the, the, the story where they say that this guy is praying and he's very holy and there's a flood and the flood is building up in the house and he's praying to God, please save me, please save me. And a guy comes back in a rowboat and he says, jump into the rowboat, I'll save you. No, 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 God will save me, I'm praying, I'm praying. And you know the story and the helicopter comes and then he drowns and he goes to heaven and he says to St. Peter, why did God not save me? He said, we sent you the helicopter and we sent you the <laughs> rowboat. You know? So it's like we have to take our own responsibility. And I yeah. feel that with myself, it's like the buck stops here. Yeah. You know what, Pauline, in every major religion, the expectation is that you're going to control your impulses in some way. You're going to be a good member of society. Not that God is going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And in Overs Anonymous, they flip that on its head. They say, well, you have to wait for God to take it away. And in the meantime, you're just screwed. Yeah. And it's, it's the wrong message. <laughs> so tell me your message. Why are overeating, stress eating and binge eating so prevalent in our culture today? Sure. And then I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story also, if that's okay. Okay, that would be excellent. Yes, please. Okay. So 
I think that part of the reason overeating, binge eating, and stress eating are so prevalent is because of the addiction treatment industry. The addiction treatment industry, essentially like we were just talking about, they say you can't have just one, right? You can't quit, you can only abstain. So there's this message of disempowerment. Mm -hmm. Now, if you couple that with the fact that the big food industry has an incentive to put the most calories in the smallest space for the least amount of money, spend literally billions of dollars figuring out how to make it look attractive with the best packaging, billions more to advertise it to you. And then, you know, you have this overwhelming force coming at you with these, these hyper palatable foods that are pushing our evolutionary buttons on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have the addiction treatment industry saying you can't, you can't control yourself. Well, what, what do you expect? Mm -hmm. what, what do you expect? But, but when you, it, it's a little bit like being in the Matrix. When you ever see the movie The Matrix, yes. you take the little red pill yeah. over. If you take the right pill and all of a sudden you can see what's going on, it is possible to step out. Most people don't, but it is possible to step out and see what's going on and saying, wow, I grew up with like 7,000 advertising messages a year and not one of them was for fruit and vegetables. Yeah. Wow, that, that, that's what's going mm -hmm. on. That's what's going on, and it's it, it's kind of frightening. It's it's an epidemic for the way that we're treating our bodies and the medical problems, and I think your listeners probably know all about that. Um, but particularly as you're going into you know a later stage of life and trying to take care of yourself and live well, it's it's very sad. It really robs people of a lot of things in life, and even if you're not talking about the disease and energy that it takes away from you in later life, while it's going on. I mean, you and I were joking before that there are some people. My sister, she takes. She takes one or two squares of chocolate out. She folds it up really nice and neatly, and she puts it back. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. How, how, how can you not finish that? that yeah. but, but for people like you and me, and I, I was a chocolate guy also. I don't say chocoholic because that implies that I can't control myself, and I can. Uh -huh. I, I was a guy for whom never was easier than sometimes with chocolate. For people who lose control, it really feels like there's this overwhelming force inside of you. It's... It's the lizard brain. It's that early evolutionary part of our survival drive that has gotten hooked on these hyper palatable foods and all these messages. Um, and it feels like it obliterates that part of you which has goals I and mean, aspirations and love interests and desires. During those moments, if you eat two chocolate bars or five chocolate bars and it feels like you can't stop, you lose a couple of days of productivity. Yeah. You lose a couple of days of your life when you do that. It's miserable. It's miserable. It, it buzzes through your body. You can't sleep. And then you feel like you need to eat something else to, to calm down. And so a lot of people go to overdo it on protein or starches right after they've had a whole bunch of chocolate. And it takes days, if not weeks, out of your life. And so we all joke around about it. But the truth is, it's a miserable way to live. And there are people, there are people that call me who say they're you know, sitting by the refrigerator and they want to kill themselves because they, they just can't stop. Yeah. So it's a very serious thing that we're, we're talking yeah, about. I'll tell you my, my story. When when I went through my divorce, it was a very acrimonious divorce. And I had two little kids and I was home alone at night. And almost every single night I had five chocolate bars. Yeah. A pint of Ben and Jerry's and two packets of Pringles or some kind of potato chips. Every single night. I must have put on about 15 kilos in that one year. Yeah. You know, I've, I, I've been there too. There, there was a... Um... I'm just divorced, but I, I took care of myself through the divorce. But about, gosh, 15 years ago now, I had a very bad business failure. And during that time, we went $700,000 in debt, and I didn't have any way to make that money back. And I, I just used food to you know, try to calm Medicate, it. to medicate. Yeah. yeah. It's like a drug. I always say a chocolate is my drug of choice. It, 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 is, a, it yeah. is a drug. It's, it's, a, it's drug, a way yeah. of getting high with food. It's a way of getting high with food, um, which is an important thing to acknowledge because you can find substitutes that will kill the craving, but you can't get high in the same way that you got high with chocolate. So, you know, you could eat carob or you could have, you know, something with stevia and you could find a substitution that will be better for you and give you, it'll take away the misery of the craving, the physiological critical craving that you feel, but you don't get high. And when people realize that they were kind of abusing their body with a food drug, I find that that translation of paradigm to the drug using paradigm really helps people to say, okay, well, I don't want to get high with food anymore. I can accept having carob. But while they're trying to get the same feeling all the time, it just, you can't get it. You just can't. Where, 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 where? We were going to talk about why is it so prevalent in today's society? Yeah. So, so it's prevalent because of all the money being spent. It, it's prevalent because the addiction treatment industry is promoting the wrong idea. And it's prevalent because it hits the evolutionary button. 
the lizard brain. It's that part of us that evolved earliest in life. It's, a, it's kind of the part of the brain stem, and maybe it's a little more than midbrain. A neurologist would correct me, but, but basically I'm correct. And in the earliest parts of our evolution, before there were mammals, before there were you know, human beings that could delay gratification and make goals and form loving bonds, there was this brain stem. And the brain stem set, when the brain stem sees something in its environment, it only thinks one of three things. Do I kill it? Do I eat it? Or do I meet with it? There is not the neocortex and the, the limbic system and the, you know, all of the higher order brain functions that are meant to regulate that very powerful thing. What's happened is that the combination of, of big food and the advertising industry has kind of disempowered this part of our brain. And these hyperpalatable foods go right to the, they go right to the lizard brain and we have to figure out how to re-engage this part. But what you'll notice is that these are later evolved better functions. We're wired to win. This is why this is so important. We're, we're actually wired to win, but you have to know what's going on and you have to you have to know what it takes to separate. Now, here's what happens the way that most psychologists, the way that overeat is anonymous. This is why it took me personally 30, 40 years to figure out how to stop overeating. Because I'm, I'm a psychologist in a family of 17 psychotherapists and psychologists and social workers, and I'm very, very compassionate, feeling oriented. And so that's where I look for the solution to my problem. It's, it's like I had this inner wounded child, and if I could find this, if I could love this inner wounded child enough, then I'd be able to control myself. Then I wouldn't need food because I was in the nomenclature of Overeaters Anonymous, I was self-medicating, I was trying to comfort myself, I was trying to escape from the pain. So I tried to solve all of that first, which by the way, I kind of proved that it existed with that 40,000 person study, but I also learned that it wasn't the solution, mm -hmm. it didn't help. It didn't help to know why I was eating chocolate as opposed to uh -huh. cookies. Uh, it didn't help that my that I knew that my mama didn't give me a hug when I wanted a hug, she gave me a chocolate uh -huh. bar instead. It helped me in some other ways personally, but it didn't help me stop where reading. The problem is, the problem is you don't want to nurture this thing at those moments. This is like a rabid dog. And if you see a dog snarling and drooling and you know, a Doberman pincher that's mm -hmm. out of its cage, what you want to do is dominate it. You want to make it frightened of you. You want to respect what you're dealing with. This is your yeah. worst enemy. And you want to get it mm -hmm. back in the cage. So the appropriate attitude is not love and nurturance towards this thing. And this thing is not your inner wounded child. You might have an inner wounded child. This is not your inner wounded child. This is your worst enemy. The appropriate attitude towards your enemy is the intent to kill. You can't kill it because you need it. It's kind of- Part of you. But the attitude is the intent yeah. to kill. And so here's what worked for me after you know, years of feeling like I couldn't control myself. And you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a clinical psychologist and I used to work with couples and families. And I, I would be sitting with couples and just thinking about when can I go get a whole pizza and you know they, <laughs> it, it was it was an obsession yeah, yeah. And, and, but I wasn't being fair I mean I, I wasn't really able to perform my function the best that I could mm -hmm. because I was so obsessed with food what really solved this for me I heard a guy talk about an alternative to the 12 steps he deals mostly with the black and white addictions he deals mostly with drugs alcohol smoking the kind of things that you can just yeah. quit you can't just quit. You can't just quit eating food. You've got to. You got to fish. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to take the line out of its cage and walk it around the block a couple <laughs> times a day. But he was the first person I ever heard advocate. His name is Jack Trimpey, and you can find him at Rational Recovery. And by the way, if you struggle with one of those black and white addictions, don't use my stuff. Use his. He's much much better at it. My stuff. Okay. How do you spell his second name? Uh, T R I M P, and I think it's E Y. Mm -hmm. And his website is rational.org. Rational. Rational.org. Okay. Fabulous, fabulous pra paradigm shifting stuff. If you struggle with alcohol or drugs or smoking and you want to quit, don't go, my opinion, don't go to Orbit Anonymous, go to this guy. You, you can be done with it you know, in a day or two. It's, it's, it's that good. Amazing. And what, what he said was, I'm paraphrasing and he's very protective over his stuff, so I have to be careful. And he doesn't like psychologists because we focus on work nurturing the inner wounded child. I think he likes me, but I don't know. What he said was, look, you have this thing inside of you, let's separate from it. That thing is not you. Your lizard brain is not, not your you, are this part up here. You, you are love and goals and aspirations and, and the ability to delay your impulses, delay short-term gratification, you can focus on longer-term goals. This is you. You should be disgusted with this thing. You have to get good and disgusted. And he, he has a name for it. I decided to call mine my pig. Um, I, work, I work with people, some people call it their inner slacker, a lot of women call it their B-I-T-C-H. Okay. And 
all I did, and this is embarrassingly simple, given the decades that I spent researching this and the level of sophistication I have and, and all the accomplishments you read at the beginning of the interview. This is embarrassingly simple and crude, but I said, this is my pig, this is me. I'm gonna make some really clear rules. For example, I'm never gonna have chocolate again. Now, I'm not recommending that everybody does that. There are a lot of other types of rules you could make. Um, I'm not saying that everybody needs to give up chocolate. Chocolate's really wonderful for some people. It's not for you and I. So I said, I'm no. never gonna have chocolate again. And so therefore, chocolate is pig slop. I don't eat pig slop, and I don't listen to what farm animals tell me to, to do with my food. And what does that do? It's really crude. I, I have this image of a pig squealing for pig slop. And at the moment that I'm walking up to get my tea or something at the, at the Starbucks, if there's a big hairy chocolate bar standing at me, I get this image in my brain and this feeling of disgust. And I go, oh, I, I know where this is going, right? There's just that moment, those, that microsecond of separation that allows me to make the right choice. And if you couple that with extraordinary clarity about what your rules are. Now, you could have never rules. You could have an always rule. You could have a conditional rule. You could say, I only eat chocolate at social occasions at other people's houses. Or I only ever eat pretzels at Major League Baseball games. Or I only eat chocolate on the weekends. There's no reason that you have to be overly strict with yourself. The, the idea is to find, it, it's almost like being a, a city traffic planner. You want to put in stoplights and stop signs and yield signs at the appropriate intersections to avoid accidents, but you don't want to restrict the free flow of traffic any more than you have to. So if you make really clear rules and you combine that with the visual analogy and the attitude, the attitudinal shift that this is not your inner wounded child, this is something you need to dominate, this is something you need to feel disgusted with. It, it's a rabid dog. It's, it's, um, it's something you have to protect yourself from. You're not, you don't go and hug a rabid dog. You don't kiss a rabid dog. You don't feed it treats. You don't even pay attention to it. You get it in the cage. You go on with the rest of your life. That's what you do with a rabid dog. A veterinarian might have some slight, <laughs> but, but you, you got the idea. And, and so, <laughs> so the, the combination of the clarity with the attitudinal shift was what did it for me. It was not, was not perfect. It took some experimenting with, mm -hmm. even though I would say I will never eat chocolate again. I did make some mistakes, but I suddenly had this vehicle for listening to that voice in my head because I had a really clear rule. Anything that would say, that I should violate that rule had to be pig squeal. That had to be my pig squealing. And I just resolved that no matter how many times I fell down, I was going to get up again. And I was going to be nice to myself if I got up, but I was going to, I was going to shoot for the top of the mountain with clarity and I was going to purge all of the doubt and uncertainty from my mind. It's, it's the polar opposite of what they tell you in Overeaters Anonymous. In Overeaters Anonymous, they cultivate fear. They, they tell you to be constantly afraid of your own body. I'm not frightened of the cravings. I know they happen. I know, I know, I know where they come from. I know that, you know, if I pass a nice restaurant or, you know, I'm at a party or something like that, or my sister makes chocolate muffins, I know I'm going to crave them, but I, I'm not frightened of that. I just say, that's the pig. I, I know where that's going and that's it. So that's, that's the essence of it. How much weight did you lose from when you were your biggest to, to what you are now? About 60 pounds. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm six foot four right now. I'm about 200 pounds. Yeah, great. Um, you look great. And, mm -hmm. Well, thanks. <laughs> I'm a single guy now, so you have to be careful. I just got divorced. <laughs> oh, I'm still married. I'm married again. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're still married. And your husband <laughs> took you to Bulgaria, so I don't, I don't have a shot. But I exercise a lot. And so I could have a lower... I could have a lower poundage if I wasn't trying to hold muscle. So but this is about where I like yeah. to be. Sometimes, sometimes I'm a few pounds thinner, sometimes a few pounds heavier. But this is about where I like to be. Many years ago, well, it must be about 10 years ago now, I not, not, can't remember. I just, I was then, I don't know what it is in pounds, but I was 98 kilos, which is really quite big because I'm quite small. I'm like 160 centimeters, which is like five foot three. So I was cuddly. Let's say cuddly, but you know. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Just the fact of getting to 100, it was like, that was like a sort of, um, oh, you know, it was like when I stood on the scales, I thought, any more, just two more kilos and I'll be 100. And that kind of frightened me. And then the next morning I woke up in bed and I just said, I've had enough. I've had enough, you know, like, and, and I had been suffering from rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, asthma. And I was walking with walking sticks, you know, and I just said, no, I've had it. I want my life back. And even though the doctor said, oh, these are incurable diseases, I said, doctors are not gods. You know, it's like you hear of people getting cured all the time. And I just started walking I, and I stopped yeah. eating a lot of 
junk food. I still eat occasionally, but then I was eating, as I said before, five Mars bars and a pint of Ben and Jerry's and crisps and stuff. And I lost 18 kilos. So I've kind of been fluctuating between that, like between 80 and 84 kilos since then. But I have been really, you know, I've been like on a plateau and I really need to make that push again. So listening to what you're saying is like really helpful for me, especially when you were talking about the pig and the slop. Actually, I had this feeling that I was going to vomit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the feeling that you want. A lot of women think this is too harsh. If you find that it's possible to love yourself thin, then I want you to do that. I, I don't want to take that away from you. When I'm not being interviewed about this, when I'm not working with a client, I don't go around talking about the pig inside of me. I'm very, very sweet with people, but inside my head, I, I know what's happening with the impulses and you want, you want those feelings. But it was very interesting. One of the things you said earlier on was like, when you wanted a cuddle from your mother, instead she gave yeah. you a candy bar. So now I learned a lot about myself by delving in that direction. And that's part of what I found in the study that we did. W the study was about what particular food cravings that people had trouble with correlated with their personality and psychology. And I found some interesting things like people that crave chocolate tend to be feeling lonely, isolated, or unloved. People that crave salty crunchy snacks tend to be stressed at work, that, those kind of things. And at that time, I thought that, okay, so the issue is I need more love in my life. I need to figure out how to feel less isolated and less, you know, I talked to my therapist about it and I, I figured out that my father was in the army. This was during Vietnam or just as Vietnam was approaching. I'm, I'm 52. And my mother was terrified that he was going to go over to Vietnam. So she, she had trouble being a mother for periods when I was an infant, like infant to two, three years old. And so what she did was she put a bottle of Bosco. I don't know if you remember what Bosco is. Oh, I don't think they have it anymore, but it, but in America it was this chocolate syrup and I would just go and drink the bottle. Oh she kept it on the floor in a little refrigerator on the floor. And when I was bothering her, I guess, when I was really upset, cause you know, two or three year old gets upset. Um, she would point me to the Bosco and she would smile when I would have the Bosco. And so I learned that I shouldn't bother my mother. I should go, go get the Bosco. Oh but here's, here's the thing. My, what my pig said about all this I didn't know it was my pick at the time was, you know, Glenn, mm -hmm. you're right. Your, your mama didn't love you enough. She, she was a good lady, but she left you with a whole bunch of holes inside of you. And until you figure out how to fill up that hole with love, we can just have ourselves a big hairy binge. So let's go get some more chocolate, right? That's <laughs> how the pig works. That's how the pig works. And mm -hmm. I found that with patients. I, I tried at the time, I thought that, well, okay, I've got a patient who's telling me they can't stop eating Doritos. So they must be stressed and, and upset at work. So let's see if we can solve their work issues. And I'd work on that. And they would say, well, that's a really good thing to work on. Just like it, it's very soulful and insightful. And I have compassion for myself. And I have compassion for my mom, having learned what I learned about myself and the chocolate. But it kind of provides an excuse to keep binging in the meantime. And what, what you really want to do is... If you want to work out those feelings of unlove, you need a practical technique to make this separation so that you stop spending days of your life high on chocolate or recovering from being high on chocolate, and you can be present with those feelings. And when you're present with those feelings, ask any therapist, when the person stops acting on the behavior, there's so much more to work on. And so the right way to go about it is to stop the behavior and then work on the emotional feelings, not give people the impression that, that they're going to have this problem until they fix the emotional feelings. And I, it's, um, it's much softer and sexier to say, I call it grandma therapy. It's therapy is like, well, come sit in my lap and I'm going to give you a hug and we're going to fix these problems. You know, you're feeling in love and that's why you're overeating. Why don't you just let me cuddle you? Mm -hmm. You know, I can be compassionate to you, but stop the overeating first. It's not as hard as everybody makes it out to be. It's not as complicated as everybody makes it out to be. One of the other authors that I really respect who kind of wrote in the same direction, um, her name is Katherine Hansen. She wrote a book called Brain Over Binge. She says, you need to learn to treat this as neurological drunk. Okay. That's all it is. It, it's like an alarm clock and you just dismiss it. If you hear it, you just dismiss it. You don't engage with it. It's just neurological drunk. And according to the research in neuroplasticity, what fires together wires together. So every time you have a craving, if you dismiss it, you're actually programming your brain to stop having the cravings. If you nurture it, if you try to love it, um, mm -hmm. you're training your brain to have more cravings. And it's really that simple. So every craving is an opportunity. Okay. So is there something like we should do, not just to imagine this pig or something disgusting, but some other action that we could take, like say, okay, yeah. I'm going to drink water instead. 
And that reminds you, that's like a trigger, a physical thing. That, is that a good thing to do? That is a good thing to do. The first thing to do is to figure out how do you want to eat? What I usually ask my clients in their coaching sessions, and, and by the way, we're talking about this in theory, but when we're done, I can send people someplace where they can hear a whole bunch of sessions so they can actually hear what it's like to work this through. What I ask them in the coaching session is, how would you like to eat if you could get your pig out of your way? I know your pig says it's impossible. I, I know your pig says, don't do this. There's no way you're ever going to do this. You're, you're too weak. What about social occasions? What about you know, this food or that food, blah, 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 blah. But let's put all that aside. What, what if you could get it out of the way? How would you like to eat? I'm not going to tell you how to eat. How would you like to eat? And we get really, really clear about what that is. And we do that with food rules. And for every rule that you create, for example, you know, I'm never going to have chocolate again, it's good to create a counter rule. Like I always have six servings of leafy green vegetables every day. I, I personally discovered that underneath my craving for chocolate was a craving for leafy greens. The lizard brain has a purpose. It's a survival drive, and it's supposed to move towards things we really need. Just like our brainstem forces us to take in a deep breath of oxygen when we need the oxygen, there are things that our body really needs that our hunger drives drive towards, but the industrial foods have perverted them. And so when you remove an industrial food, when you remove an addiction, what you want to do is figure out what's the replacement. So when a smoker stops smoking, if they take three deep breaths every time they have a craving, they feel a relief from that craving. When a binge eater stops eating chocolate, there's going to be something that they need. Maybe it's the chlorophyll. It's usually some type of natural food. So the last few weeks I've been eating chewing gum. And actually, I think it looks disgusting for a woman my age to be chewing, chewing gum. But I'm doing it to stop myself going for the chocolate. Because as I told you before, I have this souvenir candy company. And I'm thinking, if I have this in my mouth, then I can always say, no, my, I'm saying to my brain, no, I've got something in my mouth. But, you know, I don't put the chocolate in. It's not a bad, bad idea. But believe it or not, you're going to think this is crazy. But yeah. people already think I'm crazy with this technique. So who cares? Crazy ideas are good. I'm a crazy person, so I like crazy. <laughs> For a, for, I used to eat a lot of chocolate in the car, and for a little while I carried a pacifier instead. And I, I put a pacifier in mouth when I went to the chocolate. <laughs> that is brilliant. That is brilliant. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, until I pulled up at its hole and the person next to me looked at me. <laughs> it was... <laughs> and then, but by, by then I'd figured it out, so it was okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was in... I'm a doctor, everybody. I really am a doctor. <laughs> and uh, you have this program. It's called Never Binge Again. Uh, well, that's your book. Yeah, so that's Sorry. my book. Uh -huh. That's my book. I wrote it originally as a journal about my struggles with my own pig and all of the crazy things that my pig said and how I needed to learn how to use it. I published it about a year ago. It's been the number one book on Amazon for binge eating and overeating for about four or five months. Unexpectedly, I really didn't expect that. It's free for Kindle and Nook in the United States. If you can't get it there, I can give it to you in PDF for free. Um, and then the paperbacks are available for a small charge, and it's available in other countries for a small charge too. What you want to do, though, is is go to neverbingeagain.com. Is it okay if I talk about this, Pauline? Of course, that would be great. Uh -huh, please. Let our listeners are eager to get rid of their binging. <laughs> yeah. So, so the book is free. Go, go to neverbingeagain.com. Click on the big red button that says free reader bonuses. And the reader bonus includes a link to the latest version of the, the free book, no matter where you are. And the other reason you want to do that is in addition to the book, I spent a lot of time, this is my life's mission at this point, so I spent a lot of time developing a lot of free materials, including a, a whole set of recorded coaching sessions, because Pauline and I are talking about this in theory right now, but it's one thing to talk about it in theory, it's another thing to hear me work it through with clients in real time. It's another thing to hear their fear of adopting these rules and kind of see them see them separate the pig for themselves and see how excited they get when they actually get it. Um, and then there's a couple of follow-ups with people that show you what happened afterwards. So that's a really important thing to listen to. And I provided a lot of free food plan starter templates so that if this appeals to you and you want to see more specifically the kind of rules that tend to work for people, and then you have to take ownership yourself and make your own so you can customize it. But all the templates are there for you and a whole bunch of other stuff too. So. Well, that's excellent. I mean, I believe very much in the law of attraction and I believe that the universe has sent you to me so that I will take part in this. And, and another thing I believe is that when you, when you announce something to the universe and on radio or podcast and the whole world is listening, that you're going to do something, then you've got that behind, you know, it's like, oh, I've, I've, I've admitted it in public, now I have to do it. 
Yeah. I just want to say that if you want me to at, at any time, I'm happy to come back and coach you through this. Okay, wonderful, okay. wonderful. Okay. Because what I'd like to do is start some kind of plan. I told you I was in Bulgaria and we were eating like crazy. My host is, I used to live in Bulgaria, oh, 24 years ago. I was a, a volunteer there in the orphanages, helping the orphans. And so I still had friends there from that time period. And we went to stay with this guy. And <laughs> honestly, he, I love him to bits, but he had become so fat. He's, he was like, like my father used to be. When you cuddle him, you have to sort of bend over like that because the belly is so big. And of course, obviously, he likes to eat. And the, <laughs> the breakfast was like yeah. a feast. The lunch was like a feast. The evening. And he kept saying, and we went shopping. Oh, we'd like to go for ice cream. Would you like some cakes or would you like some pizza you know and it was all the bulgarian food as well and i think to me it felt like we never stopped eating in fact there was one night i just said no i have to go to bed i can't eat anymore <laughs> and i put on three kilos in that's two weeks yeah P people feel like there's nothing you can do in those situations but you, you really can you really can i, I want to encourage you to listen to a couple of the coaching sessions you'll, you'll be um that would be great I want to ask you right now, one of my downfalls is I have a lot of visitors because I'm in Iceland. And before I said to you, before we started recording, you were excited to hear that I lived in Iceland. And I said, if you come to Iceland, call me and I'll show you around. Yeah. So a lot of people take me up on this. And unfortunately, a lot of them bring me a gift and it's usually chocolate. Yeah. yeah. So what is the, the most polite way to tell people, don't bring me chocolate? You know? Um. Well... It's not necessarily how I would normally approach it. I, I let people bring what they want to bring, and I give them feelings. I, I don't tell them I'm, I'm going to eat it. I don't tell them that I'm not going to eat it. That is so sweet of you. Th thank you so much. You, you know I love chocolate. Thank you so much. And they'll say, well, you want to have a bite? I say, well, not right now. I'm a little bit um, – I have to sleep tonight. I won't be able to sleep. But it's so sweet of you. And you take that and you give them a hug because it's about the social exchange. Yeah, they, yeah. they want you to know that, yeah, they thought about you and – so you give them love. That's what they want. They don't have to see you eat it. Okay. But then what do I do with it? Because <laughs> the last time I thought, right, I'm going to put it in the cupboard and I'm going to give it to somebody else. But I forgot about it, to be honest. And then a couple of days later, I, I was having the craving. I thought, oh, there's that bar of chocolate in the cupboard. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, you need to decide what your rule is. Okay. You, you need a crystal clear rule. Maybe it's I never have chocolate and I'll never have chocolate again. Maybe it's I'll only ever have chocolate on weekends, whatever the rule is. And once we do that, then I can accurately say, Pauline, your pig is convincing you that you can't have chocolate in the cupboard or not eat it. And your pig is craving chocolate, you're not. And you, you just keep on switching the language. And it, it's a very subtle difference, but it gives you that microsecond. And then you can choose. Now, some people choose to still have it, but you will no longer, what, what Never Binge Again does is it takes away the experience of powerlessness. Mm -hmm. You, you recognize that you're fully in, in control. And when you have that feeling of power, even if you make the wrong choice from time to time, you suddenly realize, well, I can make the choice. What do I want to do with it? And it gets better and better. Well, that's excellent to me because to me, um, I believe that we have the power within us to do amazing, amazing things. I'm really excited to start this. I'm going to talk to my little pig tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So are, are there, we're nearing the end of our time. Are there any last words that you'd like to give to our listeners? It's a lot less complicated than you think. And, and all you need to do to never binge again is never binge again. It, it sounds really profound, but that's really all you need to do. With clarity about what that means for you, exactly what your food plan is, so that if people followed you around all day and they knew, knew what your rules were, they would know with 100% clarity whether you were on or off those rules. With kindness and love to yourself, with ruthless contempt for your inner pig and uh, with the willingness to get back up if you happen to make a mistake, which as you're setting out on your commitment, just like if you set out on a marriage commitment, I've never heard this marriage commitment, uh, this marriage vow to wedding. It's like, well, well, I'm 80% sure that I can be faithful forever, but there, there sure are a lot of attractive people out there. And you, you don't want me to, you don't want me to lie to you, right? I'm just being honest. <laughs> that, that's not a commitment. Right. So with 100 percent commitment, like you'd make it a marriage, but with the simultaneous willingness, there's a little piece of you that knows that if you do make a mistake, you're going to be kind to yourself, figure out what happened, adjust your rules if you need to and get up again. That's how you do it. OK, thank you very much, Glenn. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I, I loved it. Thank you. And as usual, we have to tell everybody that we're not giving out medical advice. If you want medical advice, please go to your medical practitioner. Yes. 
and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now. Thank you, dear. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Menopause Morph, your time to change. If you've enjoyed the program, be sure to subscribe to the next one and please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help us spread the message about thriving through the menopause. To get a free ebook, more menopausal resources, and to connect with Pauline, please visit www.menopausemorph.com.